friends that have their own the IR channel. Mm-hmm. They won't just talk to kids because they can't help them with the issues. Yeah, maybe they could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a little disappointing because it's, it's a very good problem to work on. Welcome to you. Then you're gonna sit back down. No, but then I'll sit back up. I'm gonna stand by the house. But it literally is gonna be musical chants. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Welcome to our weather watch. For those of you who have not come before, and it might be a lot of you, we do this every Friday in this room from 12:15. To roughly one o'clock, we try to keep an eye on the clock. We know people have to go someplace and stomachs grumble and whatnot. So, um, but if you haven't come before and you left your lunch somewhere because you thought nobody eats their lunch here, you're wrong. You can bring your lunch here. It's very informal, so you want to make sure that you um, look at this as, a, as an informal weekly gathering about. We're going to talk about the weather. What we try to aim to do is talk a little bit about the current weather uh, and. Um, some of the you know interesting things that might be going on around either our own country or somewhere else in the world and then we'll talk a little bit about a forecast both for weather in our own locale and then other places where it might be interesting uh, so that's the basic outline it never takes the same form every from one week to the next but it has certain elements of it that that show up uh, rather routinely in the discussion so uh, Pete Pokrantz our computer guy in the building if you don't know Pete Pete's got a, an, an ear to the ground and, and uh, hands and a bunch of different instruments and so on. Some of those are cameras on the roof, so we often have as our, uh, instead of the annoying commercials you get at the cinema when you go to the movies now, you get these beautiful images of, uh, of things that are going on around the building. And this is this morning sunrise, so watch this. Boom, beautiful sunrise. And then the clouds came in, and we'll talk a little bit of where they came from and what they're related to, of course, in a discussion of the current weather, and then we'll be looking forward to uh, the, the Badger dismantling of the New Mexico, whatever they're called, uh, tomorrow, and we'll try and get a forecast for that uh, to help people understand how they might plan. So, Pete, if we can start with our satellite movie over the continental United States, <coughs> and Canada and adjacent waters. And we'll look at the visible first. So, this is from GO-16. And it's going from about 7 a.m.-ish this morning to roughly the last 15 or so minutes. And so you can see a number of interesting elements on this map. I'll start out on the far right side, the eastern part of the map. And so here's current tropical storm Florence. It will become Hurricane Florence again. It had a history, I think, already. It's Hurricane Florence, right? And now it's going to go back to Hurricane Florence over the weekend, probably sometime on Sunday morning. And then we have a substantial threat for an impact along the United States shoreline. Delmarva Peninsula, all the way from the Carolinas, all the way up to New England, actually, is somewhat under the gun for about a week from now. So it'll be Thursday and Friday. But Professor Morgan will talk more about Florence and uh, display some of the uh, uh, really wealth of guidance that we have to look at these storms uh, well in advance. So that'll be an exciting but separate portion of our discussion today. But I know, of course, that Florence is out there and present. There's a couple of areas of investigation, one near Bermuda by the tropical uh, the hurricane center. Nothing's taken shape yet, except it's a broad region of convective activity. There's Bermuda right there, the green dot. And so this is another uh, area of some interest. And to remain in the tropics just for a while, I think we can see Bailey on the periphery of this image. There's Hurricane Olivia uh, headed, well, really out in the open eastern Pacific 
and uh, I think it's now Tropical Storm Norman out ahead of him, uh, of her is uh, just north of the Hawaiian Islands. And so it's been a pretty active Pacific hurricane season. They're already up to hold, which I think is about on average, right about this time of year, first week of September there. Well, what's the different is, is, is their strength so far to the west. They usually, this one they're usually yeah. in the East Pacific and get up to all, but they're normally off of Baja. The fact that they're getting toward Hawaii yeah. is very unusual. That is weird because they already had a run in with uh, which one was it earlier this uh, summer? Lane, Hurricane Lane. So That's only right. a few storms back, and now they've got another this one. This one's category three. straight into the big island. Yeah, so pretty interesting uh, situation. And until Lane, I think the Hawaiian Islands had had two land falling hurricanes since 1950. So now they're going to have maybe two within a span of two or three weeks. Now there was some article in the, I don't know how incredible it is, but they said when they were going, the worst places to live with climate change, and the number one worst place was Hawaii. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, because, uh, interesting. because they figure it's going to be hit a lot in, wow. in, the, next, in the next century. Yeah, so uh, the palm trees that are on postcards today will be laying strewn across the beach in the future summer. <laughs> So one has to be careful about when one decides to take vacation. Um, so that's the adjacent waters, both in the in the tropical Pacific and the tropical Atlantic. And then I want to talk about this disturbance, cyclonic disturbance, more like a, a, an autumn winter storm up in northeastern Quebec. And we'll see some elements of uh, what's associated with this structure as we move forward um, in the discussion. But there's also another storm, a mid-latitude storm, that's well out to its east off of uh, Newfoundland and south of Greenland um, that has a trailing cold front that goes all the way from the North Atlantic through New England. It was 98 degrees uh, yesterday for high in Boston, and then they had a thunder shower. Well, it was actually a thunderstorm. So it was a real squall that came through there, and the dew point drop, temperature drop, and all that. It's all tied with this cold front, and that cold front is also fairly south of our border with the state of Illinois. So we are uh, enjoying the second of what might be as many as five or six straight days without any rain, which we haven't had uh, that lengthy a period in at least three weeks. In fact, if, before we say any more about this, it brings me to a comment about our uh, rainy period from August 16th to September 4th, we had, or September 5th, we had nearly 12 inches of rain reported at the airport. Obviously, many places not far from the Madison airport had probably close to 20 inches, certainly 15 is not unusual uh, in a lot of locations. Our annual precipitation is 35 inches here in Madison, and the summertime, June, July, August, average is 12.2. So we had almost 90% of our summer seasonal average precipitation within just a 20-day period over these last 20 days. And so really an exceptional heavy rain event, and of course there's been widespread uh, ugly. Here you go, Ed. Yeah, look at that for us just today. It's, we're over a foot above normal. Yeah, we're way, way above normal. Here's the normal line for this day, and that's where we actually are. So we departed normality right around the time you got out of school last spring. Okay, so ever since then, things have been wildly abnormal. And if you are students in this department, they will remain abnormal until you graduate. I can assure you that. <laughs> that's, an hour, that's our goal. Uh, but Pete, there were a couple of images. Uh, thank you for that one. There were a couple of images here. The 2008 precipitation, we had a really extreme, mostly August. I don't remember June being extreme, but here's June 1 through 30, 2008, where we had in Dane County, especially northeastern Dane County, over eight inches of precipitation. And just to the north and west of the county itself, we, uh, some places were in the range of, you know, 15 or so inches of rain. And uh, so that was a rainy period. Um, then the, we have 2018, and Dane County is in the purple, I mean, the, the pink with a few purple spots. This is Professor Tripling's house right there. It's <laughs> <laughs> over 20. And uh, the purple is 15 to 20, and all of that pink is 10 to 15. This is a 30-day period ending just Wednesday. And uh, you could stop that period at August 16th instead of August 6th, because it was, really didn't rain much before that. So most of this fell in a 20-day period. This is exceptional. So it's at least four times as heavy um, uh, rain as what we expect in the summertime uh, that happened over this 20 day period. So I think the over 20 area, I think there's a town, Ontario, Wisconsin, that got 27 inches of rain. Oh, like in Dane County? Hours. Is that right? It wasn't Dane County, it was farther north. Oh, okay, one of the northern counties. There's yeah. multiple places that okay. within like 
a 48 hour or less period got over 20 inches of rain. Amazing. Well, amazing. And so these are tropical sort of rain amounts. And I think there really was a substantial influence of the tropics. It's not uncommon for there to be some influence of the tropics as far north as Wisconsin in July and August, but this was an exceptional uh, occurrence of that. Now, so just keeping in mind that we, we're just absolutely saturated. Let's go back to the satellite movie, if we could, after this quick review of that, and count our lucky stars that just to the south of the border and at the border, it's still raining heavily. And the forecast, as Professor Morgan may get to, I don't know if he will, but we were looking at it together this morning, the forecast for the next several days in the northern counties of Illinois is, you know, on the order of six to 10 inches of rain. And part of the reason why is former Hurricane Gordon, Tropical Storm Gordon, is now sitting just northeast of Little Rock, Arkansas. So this is a tropical disturbance, naturally emerging from the tropics, and um, carrying with it uh, a circulation which is impelling some substantial uh, water vapor flux forward, perhaps larger than would normally be the case. That is occurring at the same time as this front that you see uh, manifest in the clouds has sagged southward. And boy, was it slow. Wednesday, we had rain all day long, dew points in the high 60s. And then finally, by the time midnight or 1 a.m. came along, you could start to see the dew points start to drop. It took its sweet time sliding southward through the state, and it's now stalled in northern Illinois, that front has. And that front has, uh, we'll see in some of the diagnostic uh, things that we can interpret from the observations, it has the ability to produce a circulation, um, vertical circulation, making air rise on the warm side and sink on the cold side. And as long as there's uh, an available moisture supply, and as long as Gordon has any circulation, there'll be a kind of a target for that moisture supply straight up into the, the gut of Illinois. Uh, there's going to be heavy rains that will result from the confluence of those circumstances. Yeah, another interesting thing is the fact that we can get some evidence of, you know, that it's very um, warm and the moisture content of the air to the south is really high. Is really high. As you can see, there's the cumulus clouds forming across much of the southeastern United States. So that's not too unusual, but the, I think an unusual aspect is that the level, the persistence um, of high water vapor content air and the, the level of water vapor content in the eastern United States has been, I think, through the roof in terms of records. I, that must be true. Yeah, and so or, how did you measure it? Could you measure it by number of hourly observations with a dew point above 65 at a station and just go through the historic record and find out, has this been an unusually muggy summer and an unusually muggy period? It certainly is manifest, as you point out, in these fair weather queue. And even the sea breeze front along the east coast of Florida, look at that thing move rapidly inland and then develop intense cumulus over the center of the but, peninsula. But you know, you know what? I mean, the kinds of precipitation we've been having this summer, I don't think you see anywhere in the Midwest ever. I mean, even if you certainly if you go to our west, there's a couple important Colorado floods mm. once in a while. But if you go to Nebraska, Iowa, these kind of precipitation things just don't occur mm. in the summer until you get to the Gulf Coast and you actually have tropical storms coming in. Yeah, yeah. And, and much of what we had is not a tropical storm. But what you see there and continues to persist is this upper level flow from south of Baja. Up across the U.S., which is the which is the path of the North American monsoon. Yeah, yeah. and the monsoon normally stops in in Arizona. And the question I have is: the monsoon extending into the Upper Midwest in the last decade or so? Yeah, you were talking about it last week. It's a it's a really good question, and maybe uh, amenable to analysis. You could actually start to to yeah. figure that out. What are some of the signals that you've looked at and watch them moving through? Uh, through the time series over a number of, of summits. Uh, one thing that's always curious about this time of year, late August and September, is that we do have the incursion occasionally of, you know, lot, a tumble like baroclinic zones. And so those are engines for the production of strong vertical circulations, but it's happening simultaneously with the incursion of tropical cyclones from the Gulf of Mexico and from sometimes the Eastern Pacific into the central plains of the United States. Well, and that conspiracy of circumstances Historically, there's never an intersection between the monsoon and the polar front. Right, that's right, that's right. Now there is. It may be, and it might be in certain longitude, restricted in certain longitude bands. Because the further east you go, there's no way it's connected. Right. The west you go, you're cut off from the southerly flow that has water vapor. So it's really a limited longitude. Yeah, you know, and the, and the forecast for climate change and what's going to happen in the Midwest, I don't remember anybody ever 
thinking about the monsoon possibly becoming strong. Yeah, the, the discussion centers instead along the, the lines of, and we're hearing it now on the news, um, more frequent intense precipitation events, but without attribution. You're not really yeah. saying what is it that's leading to them. It's right. not a direct consequence of either a monsoon or an enhanced interaction with barracleic disturbances to the north. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's uh, really interesting. We may have just lived through an episode of that. Now, in this particular case, when you get this monsoon flow, the moisture is not coming from the Pacific. It's what you said. The moisture is coming from the Gulf. Yeah. But the circulations of the monsoon are drawing it into a line that feeds up into this area yeah, yeah. along the polar front. Yeah. So it's the upper level circulations that are drawing that moisture into a plume that hits us. It's, but it's coming from the Gulf. Yeah. So that's a, a really interesting potential um, signal that we're seeing as uh, things change globally and they're happening locally. And as I say, uh, just to emphasize one last time, we're lucky it's not raining here again today. With a, with a displacement poleward of this baroclinic zone, just a few degrees, well, a few hundred miles, um, half a degree, we would be soaked again today, and probably for much of the weekend. So, um, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't handle it, so it's a good thing that hasn't happened. So that's a broad picture of what's going on around the continent. We'll look at some of the signals, uh, both kinematically and thermodynamically associated with the cyclone over at Quebec, the baroclinic frontal zone to our south, and some other elements of the circulation over North America, and then probably turn it over to a forecast. So um, let's go to the super Pete's. No, 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 uh, radar first. Sorry, Pete. Let's see what fraction of that cloudiness is precipitating. We'll do the whole continental US. Uh, yeah. So, right where it, you, one might expect it, where the clouds looked uh, rather thick, that's where it's raining heavily in the central part of Illinois. Uh, as far south in Indiana as maybe Indianapolis. And then look at that, there's a training element to these, these convective elements over the central part of the state. So it's probably raining like crazy in Champaign. Champaign looks like Madison did last week. And the same with Indianapolis. And one doesn't see any southward movement at all of the southern boundary of that convection. So that's the beginning, apparently, of the vertical circulation uh, that is tied to the baroclinic zone. And this air is just being fed right into it um, like, a, like a, an assembly plant, and it's being processed. And then here's precipitation, uh, convective precipitation stretching along uh, from Kansas City all the way down to Lubbock, Texas, on the western side of, of this uh, feature. So um, that's going to be a persistent precipitation feature right there over the Central Plains for quite a number of days, it looks like. And then uh, in line with Professor Morgan's comment about the, uh, the nature of the tropical uh, air in this um, over the eastern half of the United States, look at how all the convective elements are very small scale, and they're not organized, they're just popping up as part of the daytime heating. We saw this all this week in places where uh, the air was, was in dew point during the 60s and 70s, and we're seeing it again today over a huge swath of um, our country, the southeast part of the United States. That's a short mice on the big surface temperature. Yeah, that's right. We'll take, we'll take a look at some of the dew points. So let's do that next. You'll see Gordon too. Yeah, it's obvious in both the satellite and it's obvious in the radar. There's a circulation center, and this is right about above Little Rock, as it turns out, right now. There was a, there's an obvious circulation. There. A lot of people getting cramps in that football game last night. Do you know that in Philadelphia? No. We, who played last night? Philly and Atlanta. Oh, was people that right? Were, people, yeah, people were suffering in that game. Well, were suffering. they playing down in Atlanta? No, they were playing in Philly. Oh, in Philly. It doesn't matter, actually. They're the same thing <laughs> uh, this week. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, really matter. That's what I'm saying. It was yeah. so humid and hot out there at night. They're yeah. just not used to that. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, let's uh, go to the surface map, Pete, if we could. The big, uh, what do we call that? We don't call it the super Pete because it takes no feet of strength to make it. But um, So let's take a look first in our own location. Uh, we are enjoying a 55 dew point. It's actually a little bit higher than yesterday at this time, but it's still a beautiful day. So 64 over 55 is pretty hard to argue with. And an abundance of low dew point air to our north uh, in the high 40s. Uh, that's nice. We're really going to enjoy that. We'll talk about the anticyclone that's affecting our weather um, a little bit later. Moderate rain in Chicago. It's the beginning of the precipitation uh, that's associated with this event. There's um, heavy rain in Springfield. Look at that, 70 over 70. Uh, heavy rain to the east of Indianapolis, heavy rain uh, in Terre Haute, or moderate rain in Terre Haute. So it's raining steadily and heavily across the central part of the plains, as we saw in the 
right off. Um, it's 70 dew point this morning in Philly, 80 degrees. It's a miserable day. Uh, sorry? Yeah, in Philadelphia. Yeah, in Philadelphia. And uh, Atlanta, just for the fun of it, is 90 over 69. It's a little bit warmer, but the same dew point. Uh, so there you go. That's why it didn't matter where they played last night. And here's uh, some of the precipitation associated with Gordon uh, himself, 77 at Little Rock, 75 to the north. I think that's Fayetteville. I don't know. Right. Look at those dew points. Yeah, 76, 76, 74, 72. This is all air that's feeding the uh, frontal band. And so the Arkansas has got a 78 there. Yeah, yeah 78. I think I saw an 80 this morning, but I don't know if it's there anymore. <laughs> and it was in coastal Carolina. But I don't see it now. Yeah. These are 78. Really there. That's about the highest dew point on the map. 78. Do you know if we see these? No. That should be outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> it's really ugly. Everybody Okay, uh, let's um, let's take a look at some of the broader scale uh, maps. Oh, you. before you quickly yeah, yeah. go back to this one sec, when you're focused on uh, the sort of remnants of Gordon, you can see between Little Rock and Fayetteville the circulation. These couple wind barbs that give you a sense of the circulation. Yeah, look at that. So it's down about a thousand fifteen for the center, and just remember that number because we'll see in the forecast how this begins to evolve and actually intensify. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Over the weekend. All right, thousand fifteen, both of those locations. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at a 500 millibar gap with the feet. And this is from 7 a.m. this morning, and you see two different worlds on this map at one time. Um, you have some experience with looking at them. First of all, the tropics. Everywhere south of this region of strong uh, geopotential height gradient, the geopotential height lines are in black. This is about three miles above the ground. Everywhere south of that, which coincides with the continental United States, is tropical. There's no flow. There's no geopotential height gradient, and there's no temperature contrast, all characteristic of the middle troposphere in the tropics. And then just as soon as you get to the border, suddenly there's not only substantial wind speed because the gradient of the geopotential intensifies dramatically, it's also wavy, so there's a lot of activity in that, in that strong flow. And there's also pretty substantial baritonicity. The red lines are the isotherms every five degrees. So you've got a 10 degree temperature contrast at three miles above the ground from southern Hudson Bay all the way to sort of the, uh, the northern portion of Lake Huron. So that's a substantial early September horizontal temperature contrast. And then there's this really nice looking upper level uh, vortex structure over far northern Quebec, down sheer of which, or downstream of it, is where we saw our circulation in the satellite movie. So this is a nice relationship between the upper trough and the surface cyclone. And then the baroclinic zone at 500 millibars gives one a rough idea where the lower tropospheric baroclinic zone might lie, as does this uh, isotherm itself, the minus 10 isotherm, right about there. And we saw that in the satellite picture. So it's a really nice picture of, a, of the structure at upper levels associated with a fairly intense cyclone and a strong baroclinic zone throughout the depth of the troposphere. Then up sheer, upstream of this trough axis, there's a really intense northwesterly flow heading into and coming out of the sort of originous over the western part of Hudson Bay. And in a region such as this, there's forcing for descent. So we might expect to see an anticyclone, a region of high pressure sitting over western Ontario and southern uh, Manitoba. So we'll see what that looks like when we go further to the south. Let's take a look at uh, 850 millibars. See if we don't see in slightly lower in the troposphere. Do we see evidence of the baroclinic structure that we saw the clouds uh, seem to pay attention to? So here's our cyclone. Uh, low geopotential heights in northern Quebec. Uh, a pretty intense baroclinic zone is kind of embedded deeply in the cold area. And then there's, with the storm south of Greenland, uh, that's actually where the frontal zone that comes across into the plains emanates from. And you can see that in the baroclinicity um, that, in, 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 that involves the plus 5, the plus 10, and the plus 15 isotherm coming across um, in the southern United, uh, in the uh, southern Great Lakes states. Okay. So it's really a double barrel action is a storm to the east and then this one that we saw on the satellite further to the west. Okay. There's not really strong uh, phrenogenetic activity by the winds at this point, but that's like, when it, what little there is is enough to produce clouds along that boundary and we saw precipitation as well, aided by the presence of Gordon. And there is Olivia or something like her uh, at 850 in this analysis. Okay. Um, Let's take a look at uh, the 
I guess we'll go to 250 millibobs. That'll be the last thing we look at on these. And if one gets the idea that, not surprisingly, connected with the middle tropospheric barrack, when this is if you go high enough up, you see a really strong wind speed maximum, 121, 120-ish uh, knots um, associated with this trough over eastern Canada. And um, not surprisingly, I think that's a subtropical jet way up north. And this was heresy uh, anywhere except in this building, but the fact is that's what it is. Right, Greg? I mean, yeah, that's, that, what that's what it is. It's a subtropical jet, and if you don't like it, um, you can ch try and change the rule, but you can't change the rules. That's just what it is. Well, the um, rules say that it's not a subtropical I, jet. I know, but that's yeah. why you'd have to change the rules if you, if you don't like it. Yeah. But that's but, what it is. I mean, if you, if you go by phenomenologically, it's a subtropical yeah, jet. Yeah, that's what it is. That's right. I mean, these are the tropics. <laughs> this is the boundary. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. They'll gradually recede, but that's the case today. Uh, interestingly, in association with the, uh, with the cyclone over eastern Canada and the upper trough, you see a local warm spot in the lower stratosphere is sitting just upstream of where that cyclone is. That's commonly the case because the, you've got um, your the tropic bonds is lower than 250 millibars here in the depths of that upper trough, and so then you're suddenly the temperature gradient uh, is uh, the temperature is increasing um, in the lower stratosphere, and you see that reflected. There. That's kind of interesting. Look at that beautiful difluence on the west coast. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? You see the winds there. <laughs> Not a lot of temperature contrast there, but that's because you're at a funny level. But yeah, it's a strongly difluent flow, that's for sure. And then if we could, Pete, I want to just show two more things, and I'll turn it over to Michael. One of them is, let's just take a look at the zero-hour forecast of sea level pressure so that we get a sense of what we're starting with uh, for the forecast. I mean, the GFS will work. Yeah, that's great. So remember, we had an upper trough somewhat uh, reflected again in the thickness lines, which are yellow, either solid or dashed, from 1,500 millibars. So here's our upper trough. The cyclone center itself, lowest pressure, is associated uh, or is located, I'm sorry, on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay. Um, and then this is the storm south of Greenland, that whose baroclinic zone trailing uh, to its west is the one that's affecting or helping to generate the precipitation we saw on the radar. Here's the big anticyclone that's part of the upper uh, vortex structure on the upstream side. 1,034 millibars sitting over Lake Winnipeg, or just to the east of Lake Winnipeg, um, to our north. And so uh, with the thickness lines as they are, there's a thermal wind that's coming from the northwest toward the southeast, so from Great Slave Lake toward Lake Superior. And that tends to be, um, this set of circumstances suggests that the anticyclone will sag to the south and east following the thermal wind. And that means we're going to be dominated by the circulation associated with this thing for some period of time. Uh, it would be my guess, that I've looked at the forecast, but that would have been my guess just looking at this map, and I wanted to show you that, so that we have a, a sense that the weather that's recently improved is likely to stay improved for some period of time. Perhaps Professor Morgan will tell us more about that as we go forward. One last thing I want to show you before I quit is, uh, I saved it, I think, I don't know if it's, uh, so not, I saved it as a, on the bottom. Here it is, right here. So what I do is I, every day from September 1st to March 1st, I look at the aerial extent of the minus 5 degrees C air at 850 millibars over the northern hemisphere. And I calculate, well, I guess I already said it, I calculate the area that that air occupies. And then I've done that with the NSEP reanalysis data, so I have a, like a 70 year time series. This is the average for every calendar day from 1948 to 2011. And you can see it's a astronomically, this has to happen. There has to be a ramp up of the aerial extent of this cold air as you head from the end of the summer into the, the middle of the winter or the beginning of the winter. And so uh, this is date September 1st all the way to December 1st and goes to the end of the month. And then the average is in blue. What's actually happened this year is in red. And it's just about precisely as average for the first week of this time series. And it'll be, you know, 20 weeks of this time series by the time we're done. I won't show it every week, but I wanted to show you where we are now. We're right at average. Last year at this time, we were well below average. So the hemisphere was, by this measure, quite a bit warmer than average at this time last year. And right now, it's right about average. So I have no idea what that means. I just bring it in to show it to you. So as the semester goes on, we'll probably see a lengthening of this red line. I don't know if that'll be below the average or it'll be above the average, but whatever it is, it'll be interesting. So the fact that the tropics, the affected tropics, are so far to the north over North America, and this is average, that suggests that there are parts of 
Asia or Europe that are much cooler than that. Yes, I didn't say it, but I have, a, I have a movie that I also make every day of the actual extent of the minus five isotherm. And in the Eastern Hemisphere in Siberia, it's um, there are places in Siberia, Northern Russia, and Mongolia that are about two standard deviations below normal for their temperature, over a, probably a 20 degree um, swath of longitude or something. So yeah, the Eastern Hemisphere, parts of it anyway, are colder than normal, but not everywhere, just a few places. And I think overall that, that makes the whole thing come out as about average. Well, if we have a Northern Hemisphere, trying to get the, uh, at zero hour or something. Yeah, so this tongue right here is, this is much colder than normal, extending southward into, um, you know, almost to coastal East Asia. So it should be, the minus five ice there should be only about this far south, but it's well farther south of that in the uh, Eastern Hemisphere. So that's probably what's going on in terms of making it an average. It'd be really fun if I just had, a, I had the um, imagination to just look at every single longitude sector all the time and see how they're going up and down. Be kind of fun. You can get an idea of that just doing this. So thanks. Okay, thanks, John. I have a couple of tabs at the top there. I think Steve will be the first. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael Morgan. That was John, uh, John the Martin, Professor John the Martin. Um, and uh, welcome to Weather Watch. What we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the tropical Atlantic, then uh, and the forecast, and then eventually look at the forecast over us um, from the U.S. And so, as John noted, there are a number of areas of disturbed weather. If you look at one of these maps, this is from the National Hurricane Center's uh, tropical weather um, Outlook page, and what they do is they, they monitor disturbances starting in uh, June all the way through the end of November. Disturbances in the tropics, both the Atlantic and the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, for possible development. And they'll you know make some statements about we expect these disturbances to develop in a tropical cyclone in the next three to five days, sometimes even a little bit longer out. They've been begun to extend that. And most of the summer, this was fairly quiet, with the exception of a few tropical storms or subtropical storms that formed in the central Atlantic. These are non fully tropical disturbances. Their origins weren't in the tropics, they were in latitudes, and they developed tropical characteristics and they were named events. But for most of the summer, until just about a week ago, you know, these maps were pretty blank. And just about a week ago, they began saying there's a possibility of the development of some disturbances moving off the African coast. This is the time of year that you get what are called African easterly waves that are disturbances that have their origins actually in Eastern Africa, in the Ethiopian highlands, and they move as mesoscale convective complexes you know, clusters of thunderstorms across the African continent emerge off the coast of West Africa, and once they get out of the water, they can begin to intensify rather quickly. And so that's what happened. Florence's origin was from that. Gordon's was from a tropical cloud cluster that was over the northeastern uh, Caribbean early on, sometime about a week and a half ago. But even this disturbance that's now tropical is possibly named a potential storm number eight. It's just moving off the African coast this morning. And it was actually predicted, I think when it was over mid-Africa, they were actually talking about a disturbance in five or six days moving off the African coast to be able to develop. So that's actually pretty impressive. That's something that wasn't done. These types of forecasts weren't made, you know, as short as three or four years ago. So, you know, they've really gotten um, a pretty good handle on being able to forecast these. <clears throat> Percentages, likelihood of development. And so I guess even in these cases when there are things that may or may not develop, beginning to make these forecasts, they can now verify them and then begin to get some seasonal statistics on clusters of clouds that they think are going to develop and see how well they do. So Florence is the storm that we're going to be watching for possible a landfall on the East Coast, and Gordon's what we've been viewing. So let's actually take a quick look at Gordon. I have a, and it's now a tropical depression. The, the Weather Prediction Center is issuing advisors on Gordon no longer. I'm not going to follow that so much, but um, since you clicked on it, you can go to see the rainfall potential for Gordon. Uh, there's rainfall associated with that front, that barren clinic zone that John was referring to, that's already occurring from Chicago southward. And this rain is going to be due in part to the interaction of the circulation of Gordon with that barren clinicity, and it's going to be spreading into the um, upper Midwest or the lower Midwest, the Ohio Valley, over the course of the weekend. But you're looking at rainfall amounts in the order of six to ten inches. I have a tab at the top from the Tropical Tidbits page, and we'll just click on sort of the remnants of Gordon. This is an infrared uh, imagery that you can still see the broad cyclonic circulation, counterclockwise circulation of some of the lower clouds in this, with occasionally the burst of convection is still occurring near the center of this decaying cyclone. 
at least currently decaying cycle. The region of precipitation that we saw out to the west is also you know, associated with these very deep, colder cloud tops that extend well to the west and north of the cyclone. They're not directly associated with uh, Gordon. But um, again, the colder, the more colorful these clouds are, the, the deeper, the colder they are, which indicates that they're going to be uh, perhaps associated with some very fairly deep thunderstorms that historically had been. But again, you see a few puffs of thunderstorms developing near the center of this, but this is something that's not going to be, uh, other than maybe some flooding in northern central Illinois, it's not going to really affect us too much. And this is a disturbance that we'll see in the forecast will actually eventually begin to intensify as it interacts with that barrack clinic zone. That's a different story we'll come back to when we come back to weather near us over the course of the weekend. So let's go um, click back one, please. And let's go to Tropical Storm Florence, which had been a major hurricane. That's a, hur a storm of winds over 105 miles per hour. Um, it had that a few days ago, and it encountered what's called southwesterly shear. So shear is looking at the change. In this case, this is looking at the vertical shear of the wind, the change in wind speed and directional height. And so with the southwesterly shear, there was sort of a the structure of the cyclone was getting somewhat degraded. But this image, and I don't know the length of it, we can see the timing on it, starts just before um, so 10 o'clock is uh, 5 a.m. this morning until just about re until just recently. Mm -hmm. You can notice the structure of the storm, at least in the last few images, undergoing, it looks like it's weakening, the, cl the cloud tops are getting a little warmer, and then you get this burst of convection near the center, and just before that burst, you see this thin green of clouds out from the uh, emerging from this animal. This deep convection within the storm is beginning to perhaps re-intensify. The shear has been forecast to weaken. And so this cyclone is expected to begin to re-intensify once it gets into a slightly more favorable region. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions are, you know, what's that environment going to look like? And what's the direction this is all, that this uh, storm, Florence, is ultimately going to take? So let's go back to the Hurricane Center page first, just to look at the official forecast. And we'll click back one, go down to, let's see where it is. That's Olivia. Here we go, Florence. And we can look first at just the, briefly at the discussion. Kind of neat things to see. But here's they're talking about the southwesterly shear and sort of the structure of the cyclone as they're um, occurring it. Moving to the west at about seven knots around the periphery of a large uh, subtropical um, anticyclone. And then this is the forecasted intensity over the next several days. You can see they keep it at a fairly strong tropical storm with winds of about 65 miles per hour. Then eventually they have it rapidly intensified, or say intensifying pretty rapidly by the time you get to Monday morning. Now, this was a storm that wasn't even forecast to become a major hurricane about three or four days ago. It underwent this rapid intensification, becoming a major hurricane. And then the weakening, it weakened pretty quickly after that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if this were to begin to, you know, these numbers begin to creep upward a little bit more sooner than um, the hurricane center is forecasting. But, but the end result is by the time we get to early next week, we're looking at a major hurricane in the central Atlantic, um, just about 30 degrees north, um, 72 uh, degrees west. So approaching the east coast of the United States. Let's click back. That's not Neil Berg, is it? Forecaster Berg? No, no, it's not. He does wind energy, actually. Oh, yeah. um, where are we? Uh, this is the uh, images, warnings. Oh. So with any forecast, there's always, there's always an uncertainty associated with that forecast. What the Hurricane Center does when they show this forecast track, this shows the uh, uh, region of tropical storm force winds extending from the center of the storm. Notice how asymmetric this is. The X marks the location of the, the cyclone at this, location, at this point. And then the subsequent plot points that are after this are the estimated or the forecasted position of the tropical cyclone um, out through Wednesday morning. So that's Wednesday at 8 a.m. So actually it's not even Monday. It's going to be, yeah, Sunday night, I think it goes for strong hurricane or major hurricane by Wednesday morning. It's supposed to be lurking off the southeast coast of the United States. It hasn't made a recurvature to the north. Now what's shown here, um, this sort of, we call this the cone of uncertainty, isn't based on today's forecast and the uncertainties in today's forecast that might contribute to uncertainty in the track. This is based on the historical averages at particular time intervals for what are the typical errors that are associated with the forecast of a tropical cyclone by the hurricane center. So this is not a forecast of the day. This cone has the same shape, same width, all of the season. It's not going to change during the season. No, it doesn't matter what the storm is. So if all the four computer models that are used to produce this forecast track are all on top of each other, this cone will look exactly the same. It's just a forecast error based on the historical National Hurricane Center 
uh, forecast errors um, over the last decade or so. And is, they updated every is year. Is the spine of that cone the average of the forecast trajectories? No, I think it's they, they have their own set of coming up how they want to best average that. So this is perhaps their best track. This is sort of the official forecast track. And then they lay on top of it plus or minus that, that error. So it's not necessarily an average of numerical forecast output, but it's often very close to it. In that discussion that we were looking at earlier, they kind of talk about how they blended things and what weights they give. Sometimes they look at the European Center forecast models being one that's more trustworthy, perhaps, than the GFS. But every forecast cycle, one can be better than the other. In fact, they've been saying there's been some discussion on one of the mailing lists, on the Trump mailing, cycle mailing list, that suggests that the GFS has actually had much smaller you know, two-day forecast errors, let's say, than the European Center for this storm over the last couple of days. So what about the forecast track of this, and what are some elements that go into how they make this? So this is a, a page maintained by Brian Tang, Professor Brian Tang at the University of Albany. We click on Florence right here, and he has access to European Center data as well as the GFS data. Let's go first to the zero Z run so we can sort of compare apples to apples, if you will. And so what this is, each of these small lines right here is one individual forecast from the GEFS, that's the Global Forecast System Ensemble, uh, Global Ensemble Forecast System. So they have the same, essentially this almost the same initial conditions, and they perturb that, and they let see how the model evolves over time. So each of these is a possible track that the uh, cyclone is going to take, and then they look at the sort of frequency of tracks passing within a certain grid point on the model. So the hotter these colors are, the redder they are, the there's a consensus in the forecast that it's going to be pretty close to that. The National Hurricane Center's official track is the black line. The X marks some verification of the last couple of periods. The red line is the ensemble mean, and the green line is the actual deterministic forecast. You can see the deterministic forecast and the ensemble mean are pretty close to each other. The official Hurricane Center track is actually pretty close to the GFS. Um, this is from the zero zero. Okay, so this looks like a track that would take it approaching the East Coast, but most of the ensemble members are beginning to recur out to sea. If we go to a similar forecast initialized at almost the same time from the European Center, this is their forecast track. Okay, still you know almost two sort of uh, forecast camps, if you will. One with a recurvature just off the East Coast. The other moving it into the southeast coast, near, you know, north of Jacksonville and around Savannah or so. Again, it's the same official for hurricane center forecast track. And the red is the ECMWF. This isn't the mean, this is at least the ECMWF official forecast of it from the deterministic one. This actually brings it inland somewhere uh, north of Charleston, south of uh, Morehead City, I guess, if you were to believe this particular track. Isn't there a city called Florence, South Carolina, that goes right by? Right near Hilton Head. I think there, there is. Might be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is. What are the chances? Yeah. What are the chances? And then if we look, just um, go back to the GFS for just a moment. That's the zero Z run that's run from 7 p.m. last night, taking all the data and running that model. And we just click to six hours later and see how this changes. There's a decided shift in this, much further, you know, a little bit further to the east, more back to what the European Center uh, forecast was. From zero zero last night, the GFS has been actually switching back and forth between the um, out to sea or making landfall in the last couple of runs, and so that's kind of interesting to follow that. And if we go to the twelve Z, it may be updated. I'm not certain. In just a few point, plot points here, the deterministic forecast actually makes landfall at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay and brings it right up to the Chesapeake Bay. The ensemble mean is a bit further to the east of that. And again, the official Hurricane Center track is actually a little bit, this is I think the 12Z, the most recent Hurricane Center track, it's actually a little bit further to the south of the GFS, maybe because they think that the European Center might be onto something. Mm -hmm. An interesting aspect of this cyclone is that the tracks have been bending further and further to the west over time because I think this might be attributed to the fact that the cyclone un underwent some shear, it began to weaken. So a cyclone that's weaker typically is steered by a much shallower steering flow, and that's east, that's some of the belief that people have, and that might be the cause of this. So the longer it stays weak, maybe the further and further west it might have eventually track. But let's look at some actual maps to get a sense of the environment in which this cyclone is expected to develop. So we're going to go back to Rumble Tidbits. We'll go back to their, I'll go a couple of clicks back to forecast models. 
And let's go first to the ECNWF. Skip that, I guess. If it comes up again. And let's go down to dynamical, so called upper dynamics. Sorry, scroll a little bit, please. Keep whoa. And down again. Yeah. Okay, well, let's um just step through this. Uh, you know, kind of throw the upper dynamics and step through four on this. And that goes to the next one. I think you know, oh, no, yeah, and the next one. Yeah, we wanted to top, uh, of top right here. Actually, that's the 12Z. Go to, uh, sorry, 0Z. Maybe this will show some other. Let's go back down to the bottom again. Okay. I wanted to show you something that would give you some clues to what the upper, the upper level uh, flow looked like, but I guess I misplaced where this is going to be located. Try thermodynamics for just a second. Uh, okay. Um, let's let's just advance this forward in time. You need to use the mouse keys to, to see that. You'll see the cyclone's well out to the east, and if you step forward in this. 472. Here comes the cyclone in the European Center forecast. So we keep going. Uh, our 144. Again, here's where it's making landfall into the Carolinas. So, a fairly intense storm. You see this broad anticyclone that's to the north of it. And these tropical cyclones, again, are steered by sort of generally larger scale features. And this is a pretty strong ridge that's going to um, sort of protect against the northeastern part of the United States and perhaps prevent this from recurring. If you look at the 12Z GFS, so we're going to global. And a nice picture of the outflow and the low PV in the upper troposphere, but I can't find it on this map right now. So you can see that again, this track, this is the 12Z run of the GFS. Again, looks pretty similar if we let's move it forward again. It's going to be just to the north of where landfall is based, east and WF. So there's a Maybe a convergence of solutions at this point, but it's still several days away. We'll get the middle of the end of next week before this is going to be become a factor. So we have something to watch over time. Let's go to sort of more local weather. Go to this. This is going to be from the zero Z uh, run of the MM5. I'll start out like I like to do a John's favorite meteor. I guess it's meteogram. I think it says meteogram, right? Yeah, that has to be changed. <laughs> it's wrong. But this is a 60 hour forecast from zero Z last night. Temperature, dew point, you can see the dry air that's being infected in, and precipitation. This is nice to see these two lines at the bottom zero precip rate, zero precipitation, a nice dry weekend coming up. And temperatures slowly cooling off during the period. Let's look at a time height section. This is a vertical profile of the atmosphere over Madison. It's modeled. Yellow lines are lines of, of, of potential temperature. You can see the wind direction here, relative humidity as well as in red, and the light blues here indicate vertical motion, negative vertical motion being substance. And so, as John um, was describing, this large anticyclone that's developing over south central Canada that's going to slowly um, build southward and eastward over time is going to be it's going to be associated with some modest subsidence in the metroposphere. We're seeing that occurring. That substance is going to help clear things out for us. Um, High relative humidity that's the upper troposphere, this might be a social band of cloudiness that's over us, but by the time we get later in the weekend to tomorrow, it looks like things are going to dry up enough. We might have sunnier skies with a stronger ridge over us. You can see this is to this afternoon. The uh, potential temperature near the surface kind of gets almost uniform and sort of mixing out during the course of the day with a northeast wind at about you know, 15 to 20 knots just above the surface. And then we get a much deeper mixing during the day uh, tomorrow, but probably keeping temperatures roughly the same. We saw that was the case. And just, being just this just indicates a pretty boring weekend. That's all this for. You know, when I look at this, I want to just go to sleep. So it's boring. <laughs> that's boring. So let's actually look at a surface map. And a couple things I want to focus on are going to be one, looking at the remnants of Gordon, but also just watching this ridge building in. So we're roughly right now here at 18 hours into this. So here's the accumulated forecast associated with the remnants of Gordon well to our south. Here's that precipitation that's associated with the Barrett Clinic Zone. Here's this nice broad anticyclone that's building southward over parts of the upper Midwest. 
Um, really some weak cold thickness advection, so lowering temperatures on average in the mid-troposphere to the surface over us. And again, it's capturing the precipitation along that front, but also the precipitation near the center of the remnants of Gordon. This is a little bit displaced to the east of where, or west of where Gordon actually is. 1,013 at capacity. Let's go ahead six hours from this, please. And this has a deepening to 1,011, and you can see the precipitation, again, continuing well to our south, nice big anti-cyclone. Our sea level pressures here are about 1,022 or so. It's a nice east wind with a persistent <laughs> broad geostrophic flow around the periphery of this. Northeast winds at the surface because of friction. Let's go ahead just 12 hours just to not go too long, 36 hours. This is now down to 1,007. Remember, the forecast was 1,013, now down to 1,007. As this cyclone begins to interact with the backlinic zone, it's beginning to get strong vertical motion patterns right over the center, which is helping to get remove mass out of the column and allow this to begin to intensify. And our pressures remain steady as that really strong high now is just a bit to the east of us in longitude. But we have a cyclone again beginning to interact with our clinic zone, lots of precipitation across northern Indiana, Illinois, into Ohio. So it's gonna be a wet weekend for there. But for us, Nice and dry, and this is valid on tomorrow morning. We'll go ahead another 12 hours. We'll see that precipitation continues to move to the east. Oh, slowly, now down to 1003. So this is really a nice development of this cyclone. You can imagine the winds are also beginning to increase around the periphery of this. And even our pressures begin to lower a little bit as the cyclone begins to intensify. But we're again we're protected, if you will, by this large anti-cyclone to the north. So 1,003, and then we go back to quick. There's 60 hours. And so this is now Sunday morning. The cyclone is slowly moving. Pressures continue to fall. This is still at 1,003, but it's much well, a much uh, better organized cyclone just to our south. If we look at sort of the forcing for vertical motion at this time, we have impressive precipitation amounts. Again, over in the six hours ending of this period, we have two to three inches of rain over parts of Indiana, so there's potential, I imagine, for flooding. Everyone's at the total precip. Let's look at the vertical motion forcing over this time period. We have these Q vectors at 700 millibars. We can let's go to 48 hours, first of all. See this nice dipole that begins to set up. Um, Q vector convergence in the red, divergence in the blue. These are the nice diagnostics for evaluating vertical motion. And depending on where the cyclone center is at this point, it's, if this vertical motion, the force of vertical motion is right over it, this would be a nice diagnostic for this to begin to intensify. But we have this nice couplet here in the cyclone, it's just a little bit leading urge to this ridge right here where you see the thermal ridge at this point. Over us, not much going on, which again is going to be fair weather for us. Let's go back a quick and go to 60 hours for that same diagnostic. And this dipole holds together, so the cyclone was over Indiana at that point. So this, this wave, this ridge, this disturbance is moving eastward, but also with some modest intensification. Okay, back a quick, and let's look at 850 millibars at 36 hours. So again, another depiction of um, the development of uh, what's going to happen over the weekend for us. This is tomorrow morning. Broad anti-cyclone at 850 millibars, cold advection, wind going from cold to warm. Um, it's really a nice, pleasant day setting up for, for the beginning tomorrow. Here's the thing of the remnants of Gordon in their wall, the wall to our south. And you can see the nice shift in winds with southeasterly winds here, northerly winds here, which is going to be printed kinetic going along this boundary with the thermal contrast. Okay. And go back and let's go to 48 hours. I think we'll stop there and then take a quick look at the weekend. Look Okay, so again, the temperature contrast has in fact intensified nice southerly winds over parts of eastern uh, Kentucky, with, um, West Virginia, and Maryland. Easterly winds here, so this is really going to be an active front for uh, vertical motion, very vertical vertical motion. And it's, you know, it's moist enough, so heavy precipitation spreading eastward by that time period. Again, for us, just pretty easily. And let's quickly go to the Let's go to just pivotal, I guess, and we'll just quickly look at an animation of the week of the two weeks ahead. Let's do all we do. Just 
just showing you a couple of different sites. We have some nice model paintings that Pete's put together, and these are some other ones that I think are also nice, just to pick things a little bit differently. We'll start at six hours, and we'll look at the precipitation type and rate. So this is another model. This is the GFS, that global forecast system model, and we'll animate this. We scroll down well to here, forecast hour loop, let them load up the images, and then we'll start the animation. And this is six hours of the forecast. You can see the precip one over south. And we'll just bring this back to the beginning and start it off. So you can see the development of that cyclone from 1015 we saw earlier. It doesn't drop as, as much as in the forecast model. This is down to 1010 or so, 1008 as it goes offshore. Here comes Florence in the southeastern United States. It gradually spins down. If you'll note, over us, there's not much in the way. Of, there are a couple of bursts of precipitation. Mm -hmm. Because finally, that's another strong tropical cyclone. We stop that. Maybe we can uh, just watch this as it, the remnants of Gordon interact with the better clinic zone. Again, not as intense as what we saw in the uh, MM5 forecast, but it does get down to sub 1,008 for a brief period of time. The heavy rain to the east, as we would have expected. We're nice and dry through Tuesday, Wednesday. Approaching here comes the tropical cyclone. It's Thursday, making landfall. Heavy rain, but again, we're still in nice weather through Thursday, Friday. It's a pretty boring week for us, but it'll be pretty exciting on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. they, get, they may get a landfall in the tropical cyclone. And another anti cyclone comes in, broad, cool convection there. And the last thing we'll see in this is going to be the <coughs> emergence from the tropics of some disturbance that's going to give some problems for the central Gulf coast if this were to develop. And that's why. How much do we believe nice that? What time, well, how far out is that? That's at uh, 360. 60 hours. Let's go back. I, I, I like to look at 15 days. Yeah, these are this almost cartoonish description. If you look at a forecast that was visualized just 12 hours ago, nothing. So. Well, we're not getting it. Oh, it's beginning. Oh, yeah. Nothing. Okay. So okay, let's just go down to still 384 right. or 372. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, nothing there. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. But I think we can probably bleed up through the middle of next week, I think. And I'd say it's fair to say for us, we're not going to see much more layering precipitation over the next two weeks. You might be complaining about being dry by the yeah. time that period ends. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you, Pete. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, John, for a great thank discussion. You. Of the current weather and the uh, diagnostics you had for the um, cold, cold field will be interesting to watch over the semester. And we'll be back here, same location, on Friday. All right. Have a wonderful weekend.